Hey everybody, welcome to Kira Crypto. This is Michael. I had some thoughts. Thought I'd spit them out there. I, I never really talk about investing per se on this show just because it's not so much advice on how to invest, just on things to be aware of and try to avoid and uh, learn from the mistakes that I've made. My voice is a little weird today. I got allergies and I almost died last night. <laughs> and I, got, I might need to get a CPAP machine until they can figure out what my allergies are because I was so stuffed up. I kept on waking up like every hour because I wasn't breathing anymore. <laughs> it's a weird sensation like waking up knowing that I was just woken up by my body because I stopped breathing because <laughs> I couldn't breathe through my nose anymore. So, yeah, if you hear me sniffing, that's why. Um, so things that I've learned about trading crypto, buying crypto, investing in crypto. Um, you know, everyone's always like, well, not everyone. I, no, one any, no one anymore who understands crypto is saying this. But they used to say, you know, always check whatever you want to buy against Bitcoin. Is it going up? Is it going down? You know, whatever. But now you really got to check everything against ETH because if you look at the long-term chart, ETH is trending upward over time for over the last five years, higher lows. You always want to check the lows. You don't want to check the highs because everything's going to pump and dump and pump and dump. If the low keeps going up, and that means that's something you want to be in versus Bitcoin. So I now chart everything against ETH. It just makes it easier because when I looked at a lot of these ICOs and a lot of these, you know, coins that are in the upper thousands or upper hundreds, um, just really, really low down on the market cap. I noticed one thing. They would pump against Bitcoin and then they would dump and they would just flatline, just literally just a straight flat line for like a year or two or six months or whatever. And then it would pump and then it would dump back down to that line and just be like, so I think like Doge is a perfect example. If you look at Doge, um, not this current cycle, but the cycle from 2017 or 2018, whatever it was, these are just flat lines, which means that like that's physically impossible if you think about it. Like two, all these assets don't go up at the same time because if it's a flat line, it means that Bitcoin and the asset trading against Bitcoin are going up at literally the exact same percentage to keep that at a flat line. And that's when I started noticing like this just feels all completely rigged by whales. So I started looking at stuff against ETH and I realized, wow, pretty much everything outside of a few coins are all going down long term. So I have a friend of a, I have, I have a friend who is really good friends with one of the main guys at Algorand. He's like, oh, you should totally get into Algorand. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pump. And I look at the long-term chart, you know, look at the daily and the weekly against ETH, and it's just a slow trend down. It has these big pumps, but it's lower lows over time. And that's pretty much the way with everything, except for like Solana and Luna, which, you know, are relatively still new, you know, like about a year old and uh, maybe a year and a half old, they're, they're trending up. So those are two things that I keep my eye on. And I'm not saying like, obviously this isn't financial advice, but you know, something can change a trend, but you have to have, you have to have done a ton of research in it and you have to have a lot of faith in it. That's, that's my advice. Just because if you don't have faith in it, when it continues to trend down against Ethereum, you're just losing money. It's like unrealized gains. It's like having something pump to a thousand dollars from one dollar, and then not selling the not selling it when it, when it's at a thousand dollars, and waiting for it to to, to um, fall back all the way back down to like five dollars, and then finally sell it. So great, you you bought it at a dollar and you sold it at five dollars, but you could have sold it at a thousand dollars. That's kind of what I mean. So like if I buy X coin and it pumps up 10%, but Ethereum pumped up 30%, well, I just lost a bunch of gains. So, you know, it goes back to the whole thing of like, if, if, I, if you don't know anything about that cryptocurrency, if you don't 
think it's going to um, stick around long term, like in something like Ethereum, then why are you in it? If you're in it for a quick gain, you know, when you're, when you're day trading, you know, more power to you, but you got to look at long term trends. And, you know, if you're just praying that you can hit that jackpot of that one little pump against Ethereum and then sell it in time where you actually make profit in Ethereum, cool. Good for you. <laughs> but I don't recommend that. And if you're a U.S. citizen, I absolutely don't recommend that because you have to pay taxes every single time you trade. And so why create more taxable events for yourself? If you believe in cryptocurrency, you know, it's, it's smarter in the long run from a tax standpoint, unless you're going to buck the system, buck the trend of, you know, out, out trading the market, which, you know, almost nobody day trades and is successful doing it as, you know, for a living, unless you're like a major whale. So just keep that in mind. Like there's, you know, if you have something you're super, super pumped on, yeah, go for it. But just realize that if it was in, if it was in Ethereum and it's trending down against Ethereum, you're just kind of losing money, which that's okay. Because if you're, if you have faith in this project, you don't mind the short term loss. If you have that much faith in something, put your money where your mouth is and support it. Nothing wrong with that. If you listen to the channel, you know I like Nano. So I have a small bag of that and it continually trends down against Ethereum. And I know that I'm losing potential gains if I just had that in Ethereum. And, you know, doing DeFi stuff and blah, blah, and, and maximizing my returns on Ethereum. But I like the project. I like you know, so I'm taking a gamble. It's like it's my moon coin or whatever, you know. So it, it's okay to have those. Just be very aware because I keep getting people sending me stuff all the time like, oh, have you checked this out? Have you checked that out? Have you checked, you know, like with the Algorand thing. I had another friend at work be like, oh, yeah, I'm an Algorand with all, all these guys. You know, you know, it went up, you know, 30x. I was like, cool. Did you look at the chart against Ethereum? Well, I don't, I don't do that. I'm like, okay, cool because... Ethereum went up 50x. So you just lost, you know, 20x gains in the long run. But if he's amped on Algorand and he wants Algorand to do that, you know, if, if he wants to support that, that's totally cool too. But just ask yourself why you're in something. Are you gambling? Are you risking? Are you making wise investment decisions? Or are you, you know, being steered by the market? by the community, by the FOMO, by the pumps to make bad decisions. Not necessarily bad decisions, but just impulsive decisions. Are you reacting to the market or are you, you know, being smart and thinking about ahead of time and making smart decisions with your money? Because it's at the end of the day, it's, it's your money. These are investments. Unless you're just trading cryptocurrency like a slot machine and then more power to you, sweet. The other thing to think about is not necessarily short-term gains, but long-term gains in the sense of, I know this is going to sound hokey, and I know so many people hate me trying to be the voice of reason for cryptocurrency, especially on Twitter, but you know, what are the long-term gains for humanity, right? Because those are actual costs that people forget, or not, you know, that some people, for, that the majority will forget to calculate into their profits right now i'll probably get a million people trying to gaslight me about bitcoin saying bitcoin is actually good for the environment that we're burning all this extra energy that's completely useless and securing a network that only a million people use on average a day great cool a million people are using it 10 million people live in sweden so bitcoin is using 10x the energy per capita of sweden <laughs> So that's pretty insane. Um, so what are the long-term ramifications? What are the long-term costs? You have increased health care. So if you have kids and you're choosing technology that destroys the planet, that heats up the planet, that puts more uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, what are the, if it just creates more you know, hazardous material in the air, how does it affect you? How does that affect you long term? 
Does it increase your health care costs? What, are, what were your health care costs 40 years ago compared to what they were today if you're older? Ask your parents. If you're not, if you're not old enough to, be, to know what happened 40 years ago, ask your parents. Ask them how much health care was 40 years ago compared to how much they pay now. These are things that aren't always tied to the economy. Sometimes they are actually tied to the physical planet, right? We have more kids with asthma today than we did 40 years ago, right? That's just a fact. So we knew what asthma back, we knew what asthma was when I was a kid, and it was very rare to find a kid who had asthma. I knew like one kid total. So, you know, what are the long-term effects? You could say, well, you know, I'm healthy. Okay, well, that doesn't make a difference. You know, you're going to have kids. If if you're going to have kids, you know, kids are born, they can be totally healthy and still get asthma. You know, plenty of really healthy people get asthma because their body can't handle the shit going on in the air. So are you, it goes to this, you know, it goes back to this thing of like, there's two types of people. And I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. There's two types of people. One person looks at the problem, denies the problem exists, and then gaslights anybody who tries to talk about the problem. They attack, they divert, they deflect, they do whatever they possibly can to try to convince you that the problem isn't real, right? The other kind of person looks at the problem, acknowledges the problem is real, and then works hard to try to fix it, to solve it. Whether it's small things or big things, they're just doing stuff on a daily basis to try to solve the problem. And I continually compare Bitcoin and Ethereum with that, with that analogy. Because Bitcoiners, for the most part, just my experience on Reddit and on Twitter, they deny that using that much energy is a bad thing. They say, they try to gaslight us into saying it's a good thing and that burning more CO2 will lead to more clean energy investment from other people. So they're burning down your house and saying, if I burn down your house, it'll lead to more fire, fire, firefighters. But they're not signing up to be a firefighter. So that's who you have to always keep asking yourself is, okay, so they're saying cryptocurrency that burns a ton of energy will lead to more clean energy. Are you investing in that clean energy? Are you the one creating that clean energy? No? Okay. So you're just hoping somebody else will do it for you because you don't want to stop your bad behavior. That's very telling. Whereas Ethereum people, and I don't know if it's necessarily because of proof of work and and greenhouse gases and you know global warming and all that stuff, or if it was just because of CryptoKitties, in 2017, completely shutting down the network. Um, you know, one NFT project completely shut down the entire network, made it unusable. Not shut it down, just made it unusable, ground it to a halt. Um, I don't know if it was that or if it was that in combination with the dangers of proof of work and seeing what it was doing, what it's been doing to the planet and what it can do to the planet. But whatever it is, in 2017, 2018, they started talking about, okay, we got to move to proof of stake because this isn't, it's not scalable. It's not going to work. So they actively are changing the fundamental infrastructure of Ethereum. Whereas Bitcoiners say, well, you know, somebody, somebody will come up with a layer two solution like, like Lightning Network. Okay. Well, that was, you know, that took a long time and it's still doesn't really work that well you know that that's just putting it off on somebody else whereas ethereum says hey anybody can create a layer two solution cool go for it everybody start going everybody start doing it so you know there's dozens of layer two solutions trying to be i mean a dozen it's maybe like a dozen that are like really trying to get get going and and make it work and then you have competitors like avalanche and solana and luna so it's like there's just so much stuff happening and then also they're trying to move to proof of stake on top of that. So they're not relying on 
all these layer two solutions and competitors to solve the problem. They're trying to solve the problem as well as encouraging people to, to build around them to, to help solve the problem. So it's like an all hands on deck type thing. There's no passing the buck onto other people, onto the next generation to, I mean, cause that's what, you know, that's what Bitcoiners are doing when they say it'll lead to more clean energy. Well, they're not the ones creating it. So they're passing the buck to the next generation. They're creating a mess and expecting the next generation to clean up after them so they can have more money. We've had 50 years of that in American politics with conservatives, with trickle down theory, with the defunding of public schools, with the defunding of the government in general, you know, childhood hunger increasing dramatically over the last 30 years once the private sector took over and the government stopped worrying about feeding the poor. So we can pass the buck as much as we want, but I think most Americans, Gen X or younger, are very, very conscious of the negative effects that have been brought about by that behavior from the boomers, from baby boomers. Gen Z more than anybody, uh, like millennials more than anybody, just because you know they came out of college during the Great Recession, they came out of high school during the Great Recession, and then just, you know, they've been hit left and right. And then as soon as, you know, the Great Recession starts to finally come up, then then COVID hits. And this is like, so that's two massive, you know, planetary almost shutdowns in their, in their you know, early adult lives when they're supposed to be making the, the bulk of their money. This is all coming from bad conservative politics of passing the buck. And I'll throw in neoliberals too. You know, I hate neoliberals. Um, they're conservative at heart. They just, they're cool with gay marriage. Um, but that's all it is, is passing the buck so they can reap as much benefit and reward as possible without having to pay for the long-term ramifications of their actions. And this is what I mean. It's just like, what's the long-term cost? Great, you spent, you know, a tiny bit of money to buy 15 houses and now nobody in my generation can afford to buy a house the vast, vast, vast majority of people in my generation and younger can't afford to buy a house. So that's, so now people are spending way more on rent. You know, small businesses are suffering because if you don't have, because we don't have as much money to spend locally on services, going to the bar, going to the movies, because we're spending more on rent. So like this, this affects, you know, what are the long-term financial ramifications of, of the actions? So there's all these trickle-down things and not in a good way. There is trickle-down economics, but it's trickle-down pain. The pain just keeps trickling down further and further and further. So what cryptocurrency are you investing in? You know, bring it back to that. What, what are the long-term ramifications of your project? You have to think 12 moves ahead on a chessboard. You can't just say, I want to take this piece. You have to look at the, the reactions, the cascading effect of your one move, it's going to cascade, you know, 20 moves down. What's going to happen to your kids? What's going to happen to your grandkids? What's going to happen when you retire? You know, is the planet going to st- still exist the way we think it will? You know, these are like, I know these are like really insane questions to think about, but there's talk that by 2100, you know, there could be like four feet of sea level rise. If there's four feet of sea level rise, that's like 20% of the, of our country is underwater at that point. So this idea of like everyone's, you know, I don't, and I don't, I don't get it. Like, you know, the Bitcoin maxis are like, yeah, we're all moving to Miami. It's like, bro, Miami's going to be underwater in 10 years, maybe 20. It's under, it's already underwater, like three months out of the year. You know, people were walking, same thing happens in a, In Venice, Italy, you know, the tides are going so high now, people are walking through water during during king tides. Like, that's insane. So you have to think about these long-term ramifications. It's so easy to get caught up in, like, quick gains. But if you're not thinking about your future, and that doesn't mean don't have fun now. It just means, like, keep in mind, okay, when I'm if you're making a financial decision, think about it long-term. How is this going to affect me long-term? Is it okay to invest in a coal? Like, should I buy? Should I buy you know coal stock because I know they're gonna be using a bunch of coal this winter? 
because there's a natural gas shortage, so I can make immediate profit off of coal. But is is that ethical? Is that harmful for you long term? Is it worth not? Is it worth taking that investment out of clean energy and helping that grow faster just so you can make one quick profit off of the, off of the off this winter? Like, are you actually helping yourself long term by doing that? Or are you hurting yourself long term by doing that? You know, I don't know the answer. I don't, I can't see into a crystal ball. All I can, all I know is the information we currently have, right? And things are not going well. So, you know, you can continue to put your head in the sand or you can put your head in the sand and gaslight people and say it's not a problem and you're just being dramatic and hyperbolic. Or you can acknowledge that this stuff is actually happening and you can work to help rectify it with your investments. And the only reason I invest in Ethereum is because they are that second person. If Ethereum wasn't planning on moving to proof of stake, I would not be invested in Ethereum. I just wouldn't. I don't want to support projects that aren't thinking long term. So you also have to like, you also have to support change though. Like this is my thing is the, the vast majority of Bitcoiners that I come into co- contact with do not support change in Bitcoin. They don't, ex- they don't accept bigger blocks. They don't accept you know, moving to proof of stake. They don't accept anything. They do not want to fuck with their moneymaker. You know, they invested early and they're locked in there and that's it. Like that's, that's, their, that's their sugar daddy and they don't want to mess with that. And they're afraid and they're scared, you know, because they're seeing the world changing around them and, they, and they're seeing that Bitcoin is not keeping up with that change. And so they just start gaslighting and attacking other projects. That's what they do. I mean, that's what fucking Peter does. He just calls everything a shit coin. Shitcoin shill, shitcoin, shitcoin, shitcoin. Because he's fucking scared. He realizes that he has no data on his side. He can't actually argue a point and say why Bitcoin is better than any other cryptocurrency out there. Outside of it's the number one market cap. There's nothing that doesn't have anything else. It doesn't have speed. It doesn't have decentralization. You, know, you can claim security, maybe, but not really. I mean, any coin that currently hasn't been hacked yet can, can, can claim the same exact amount of security. So I don't, you know, when you don't have data and you don't have facts on your side, that's when people start to be aggressive, verbally abusive to people because they're scared. And it's just that it's like, and that, and the thing is it's self-made fear. All you have to do is hedge your bet. And go buy Ethereum, go buy Nano, go buy Solana, go buy something, you know, go ever, whatever, whatever's out there. Um, just do some research. So I say that because, you know, I don't want to poke the bear. I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me because I have a lot of Nano listeners. But my fear of Nano is that a lot of people want to figure out how to make it work with smart contracts, how to make it work with Ethereum, how to make it work with Terra Luna, with Solana, with Avalanche, because they want to participate in the DeFi system because that's where the vast majority of money is going to go into borrowing and lending. Because there's a great episode on The Indicator, which is a Planet Money podcast. And it talks about when Andrew Jackson got rid of all the debt in the country. And it made things really hard because when there's no debt, it just, there's no money moving around. And when there's no money moving around, a thing kind of gets static and things things just start to like not work well. Because um, it's very difficult to get money to cycle through it, through the population, through, through businesses when there isn't debt. Um, so if companies don't take on debt, they don't really grow unless they have enough money in the bank and that's hard to do. So they just won't, you know, they, they grow instead of growing every five years, they grow once every 20 years because they're waiting for themselves to have the perfect amount of money for security and this and that. And, and so, you know, people don't take risks. Small businesses don't start up as fast. It's like when you take, when you get rid of debt, things really start to slow down. So, to sit there and say, well, DeFi is bad because it's re, 
you know, recreating the current financial system. Well, no, it's participating in the current in the in the financial system that we've had for the last, you know, thousands of years. And it's gotten us to where we are now. So obviously they figured out that having debt is okay. Debt's not a problem. It's when you start defaulting on that debt, when you're not good for that debt, when you're not it's the thing like the US having a huge everyone's like, oh my God, you know, our our, our debt limit's so our our, our uh, how much we owe is so high and it's just like twenty trillion dollars. Or no, it's like thirty trillion dollars. That's our current that's that that's the debt clock. <clears throat> It's like okay, well, let's let's not count 2020 because because of COVID. But even with 2020, our GDP was 20 trillion dollars. The U.S. the U.S. GDP was 20 trillion dollars. So if we really wanted to pay off that debt, we could buckle down and pay it off within five ten years, easily. It would suck because we would use a lot of techniques that conservatives love, which is denying people money. And it would grind things to a halt. It would increase poverty. We saw it in uh, in Greece. We saw it in Eastern Europe. Like, it's not it's not a pleasant it's not a pleasant thing. God, you know, I I, I definitely go in those random circles. So people in Nano want to participate in the DeFi, right? They want to figure out how to wrap Nano and let it participate on the bigger chains that are doing a lot of DeFi. And you have a small vocal community of OGs who are like, no, no, that's not what Nano is. Nano doesn't do smart contracts. Nano doesn't do this. Nano doesn't do that. Nano, no, 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 no. And honestly, man, when people talk like that, they're talking like Bitcoiners. And my fear is that's the death knell of a project. When you stop allowing innovative evolutionary growth of a project, you start denying the project of the innovative evolutionary thinkers and they go off and find a different project, which is exactly what happened with Bitcoiners and Ethereum. All these people, all everybody who's, who was in Ethereum, who is in Ethereum, they all started off in Bitcoin. I mean, not all, but you know what I mean? Like the people who were around when Ethereum started, that's how Ethereum started because all these people wanted to do that on Bitcoin and people were, and you know, Bitcoin was like, nope, nope, that's not what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is peer-to-peer transactional money. And then when that didn't work, they changed it to a store of value. And now that that's not working, they're you know freaking the fuck out because Ethereum right now is a better store of value because the Ethereum chart against Bitcoin is going up and Bitcoin is going down against Ethereum. So how can you be a store of value if you can't, you know, if you're not if you're not a better store of value than than the next coin below you? So. My fear with the nano community is if you don't, if you continue to say no, people are going to get frustrated and move off and find people who say yes. Because yes, people make things happen. No people stop things from happening. So if you don't encourage innovation in your community, then the community is not going to innovate. And you can't just rely on the nano foundation or a handful of devs because that's not how it works. Like you need new blood, you need new ideas, you need new energy. It's very easy to hit plateaus when you're working with the same people saying the same words, thinking the same thoughts over and over and over year after year after year. It's mandatory if you want to be a successful business to keep bringing in new blood and new ideas and throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks. It drives me crazy because the idea that something is quote unquote impossible is just fucking moronic because nothing is impossible as we've seen throughout the history of humanity with technology. Nothing is impossible. It may be impossible the way you envision it. Can I fly? No, I do not have the ability to fly. I cannot flap my arms and go up into the air. I can't levitate. I can't run really fast and just take off into the air. I cannot fly, but I can get in a plane and I can fly. Am I flying? Well, I'm going through the air, but I'm going through the air assisted. I'm still achieving the same exact, like the same, the same exact thing as flying. I just found a workaround. I found a cheat. Who cares? You know, go into space. I can't go to space. I can't breathe oxygen. Oh, space suit. Cool. 
found a workaround. Am I technically surviving in space? No, because I don't, I can't survive anywhere without oxygen. So once that oxygen runs out, I die. But like, these are the workarounds. These, these are things that make it possible to, to achieve the objective that people dream about. So when you tell me there's no decentralized way to wrap nano so it can interact with Ethereum or so it can run as a wrapped you know, ERC-20 token on Ethereum or Solana or whatever, I just, I'm baffled by that because science has told us otherwise over and over and over and over again throughout history. So I beg the nano community I'm begging on on bended knees, please, please, please stop saying no to people. Just say it currently, you know, we don't currently have the ability to do it. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with saying we don't currently have the ability to do that. If you can figure out a way, we would love to see it. But we haven't been able to figure it out yet. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in saying I don't know how to do it. What there is shame in is trying to gaslight somebody else and saying, you will never figure it out because I can't figure it out, right? Because that's all you're doing is you're just projecting your own insecurities onto them. There's no shame in not being able to figure something out. If you really want something to be successful, though, you have to put down your ego and and ask for help and, and let other people try and realize that they may figure out where you failed But if you really care about the project that much, you will absolutely be happy that somebody else succeeded where you failed. So please, people in the nano community, stop, stop, stop discouraging people from thinking outside the box. Okay, let's get back to investment advice or non-investment advice. I heard a great line. NFTs are a way to separate you from your Ethereum. Now, this is a cribbed quote because it used to be ICOs are a way to separate you from your Bitcoin. Altcoins are a way for, to separate you from your Bitcoin. But now that Ethereum is consistently going up against Bitcoin over the long term, you got to shift that to Ethereum. And ICOs really aren't a thing anymore. <clears throat> we're still getting new projects, but they're not coming out the way at the, at the rate they were back in 2017, 2018, the new thing is NFTs. And if you were around in 2017, it took me a little too long to figure it out and I'm slightly embarrassed, but I, NFTs are just the new ICO. With the only difference is that I actually own the artwork. Well, great, if it's an artwork that's worth zero and I don't really like it and I only bought into it because I thought it was gonna pump up to you know, 108th floor, and now it's zero, then fuck. (laughs) I've got something I don't like that's worth nothing that separated me from my Ethereum. And I definitely learned the hard way. I spent way more Ethereum than I should have. And the worst part was is it was gains from certain projects. You know, I made one good investment and then lost it all, rolling it into a different investment and... Now it's worth zero. The only upshot is that maybe like other ICOs, they'll have cycles and it'll pump. But that's a really unethical way of thinking. Because when I say that, all that technically is is saying, oh, great, maybe it'll pump and so I can sell it to somebody else. And then it'll dump and they'll be stuck with it. And and it definitely is that whole, you know, game of musical chairs. You know, who's going to be the last one holding the bag? Which is frustrating because NFTs as a whole, and and, and I'm not saying all that NFTs, because I absolutely love NFTs. I actually love the, I, I absolutely love the idea behind them and what they solve for artists. You know, I did a whole episode on why they're amazing for artists. But you have a bunch of people coming in and treating them like ICOs and, and, you know, creating shitty art just to pump it up and then kind of pushing out actual artists making actual art. That's my frustration. The good thing is once people catch on to these scams, I think people are going to stop 
investing in them and start looking for actual artists to support and the prices will go down to something nominally normal and affordable because yeah spending five thousand dollars on a frog is pretty fucking stupid and unless it goes to a hundred thousand and then it's fucking genius right i watched this great video about things that you can't really buy so like certain types of rolexes certain cars um you know like ford has their i forget the name of it like their supercar and you can't really buy it they only make like 500 at a time and you have to get on a waiting list and they have to like invite you to spend your five hundred thousand dollars to buy the car that's kind of what some of these nfts are it's just a way for people to showcase their wealth that's all it is so if you want to get caught up in that cool if you have the ability to do it and not you know get screwed but if you're not a millionaire, it might not be the best game to play. You know, maybe support an artist here, here or there. But for the most part, NFTs are NFTs right now are a way to separate you from your ETH. And it, it, it pains me to say that. Um, you know, and insert whatever chain you're on, Luna, Solana, whatever. Um, but it's just a way to separate you from your ETH. And especially when they're not actually artists, when they paid somebody to create the art and then they did a 10,000 drop and then, you know, it's just ICO people creating stupid ICOs and pumping it up and saying this one's, you know, oh, we're going to have a DAO. Oh, we're going to have this. We're going to have that. We're going to have staking. We're going to just like, it's all garbage. Once they went to DAOs, I started to realize, oh shit, this is all fucking cyclical scams. And then they started doing staking and they started, it was like, oh my God. How did I not see it earlier? It's, you know, but I got caught up in the hype. I got caught up with uh, punks with a hundred ETH floor, you know, it's just like, and Board Ape Yacht Club going haywire because somebody said something and it, and it pained me to hear it. A year ago, the punk floor was under one ETH. And I just want to smash my head against a wall over and over again thinking about that. A year ago, punks were under a floor under a one-eighth floor it's like spend five eth and you would have over 500 eth right now that's just really frustrating to think about but you know if i bought salon at three dollars cool i'd have be a fucking millionaire right now i did not buy salon at three dollars <laughs> so and i sold Solana way too soon i don't know why i sold that's the thing like we just finished probably the first wave. So don't get caught up in selling too soon if you're going to, you know, especially if you're a long-term investor. Just what are you doing? Like, I'll take profits. Okay, cool. Take profits and things you think are going to go to zero, right? But like, do you really think Solana or Terra Luna or Ethereum are going to go to zero? You know, Avalanche, maybe. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so just be careful. Just be careful with your shit. Don't get caught up in the hype of NFTs. I've really had to like kind of slowly start muting people in my Twitter feed because it's just like, there's just so many shill I, uh, NFTs out there. See, I just said, I almost said ICOs because it's literally the same exact thing. There's a new, there's, you know, a 10, 10 NFT drops every single day, you know, and they're creating crazy gas and it's fucking it up for everybody. You know, so if you if you don't like gas being so high, stop aping into every single NFT project because you're the one helping create this insane gas fees. Right. Stop buying shitty projects. And if everybody does that, then the gas is going to plummet. It's just like real life. If you don't want gas to cost so much, stop driving 100 miles a day. If everybody drives less, gas will start to slowly go down. OK, that's uh, all the happy fun time with Michael that I'm going to let you have because I don't want to make you all fucking depressed and go kill yourselves. So because I care about you, all, um, I want to thank you all for being so supportive. Uh, reach out to me because I honestly have no fucking clue who listens to this shit. <laughs> I have no idea why you guys listen to it, who listens to it. You know, like I, I, I what you want to hear I mean, just want to hear more ramblings of like some fucking poor guy who is too ethical for his own good and makes really bad decisions with his money and then talks about it and tells you all about it. Do you want more interviews? Do you want like I have no fucking clue. Nobody. Here's the thing about 
the people who listen to this show are pretty smart. And I'm not saying that to blow smoke up your ass, but seriously, because I don't, this isn't a shill podcast. It's never been a shill podcast. It's not number go up. It's not directing you to the next quick hundred X. It's none of that. This is like thoughtful, critical thinking. And people were just out trying to make like, you know, want to gamble at Vegas don't want to listen to Mother Teresa while they're at at the, at the casino, you know? <laughs> Somebody telling them like, you know, this is how you get into heaven. You're like, fuck you. I'm trying to fucking win $100,000 on crap so I can go get hookers and blow. You're like, that's, you know, it's like, cool, great. That's, I'm not, that's not the target demographic. The people who do want to hear this, people who want to, who want to think critically about cryptocurrency for the long term. So, but those kind of people tend to focus on their lives more right? They're not on Twitter all day long or Reddit all day long um, unless they have a vested interest in helping something succeed specifically. They're not, they're not reaching out to their, you know, to their podcast host that they listen to. You know, I have people who I like this show. I remember when I was on a Vives show, he tweeted, he DM me, he said, Hey, you know, we're, we, we hit over a thousand uh, listens and that was like within three days i was like okay uh, I, I think i've got i think i've gotten over a thousand <laughs> listens like twice so the people who listen to this show do it over time it's not like oh new episode i'm going to spend you know the next two hours listening to it or whatever it's just like oh, i'll get to it when i get to it i have a life i have like that's my life is more important than the podcast and that's great those are the kind of people i want listening to this but it also does kind of make it hard because I don't hear from anybody outside of a few people on Twitter. And if you're, so if you're not on Twitter, it makes it hard. So email me, reach out to me. Everything's in the show notes. If you want to donate, that helps because I got to pay Zencaster costs and I have a website. My costs are probably $200 a, a year. So if you guys can donate $200 a year, not individually, but total, that would be really helpful. That would let me know that that uh, that this is valuable to you. And that's just it. Like, what is value? So I need to figure out, like, I do it because I, I want to do it. And if you're listening just because you like hearing me fucking tell sob stories of like, and, and get on my soapbox and preach about all this fucking esoteric ethical bullshit that is probably the reason I'm single and a fucking loser, then great. Cool. If I'm entertaining you, I love it. Whatever. That's value in itself because you all know how I feel about that word value. But, you know, I do want to make it more worth your while if there's something specific you want to hear more of or you want to hear less of. I don't have an ego. You could be like, yo, shut the fuck up with that. I don't want to hear that anymore. And if enough people say that, I'll stop saying it, you know, just because at the end of the day, I want to help. I want to help the community. I want to help crypto. I want to make sure people don't get scammed or if they do, you know, it's, it's as little as possible. Because it is crypto. We're all going to get scammed at some point. Cryptocurrency, getting scammed to cryptocurrency is like driving a motor, is like riding a motorcycle. It's not a matter of wh- of if you're going to fall. <laughs> it's a matter of when you're going to fall. So cryptocurrency is the same way. It's not a matter of like if you're going to get scammed. It's when you're going to get scammed and how bad it's going to hurt. That's kind of what this, what this show is about. So if you're new to the show, welcome. If you're returning member guest listener i love you keep listening i appreciate it reach out tell me what's working tell me what sucks and uh i'll talk to you in the next one oh i'm gonna um interview sharon again i think in a couple days and we're gonna talk about um the major hiccups that happened in the last tax season because that's when things really started to like IRS really started going after people. So major uh, hiccups that people did wrong last tax season and how to avoid that this time. Um, just because I want, I thought it'd be interesting to, to go back and, and um, hear, about, hear about that kind of stuff so we can be better before we talk to an accountant. Because we want to make sure we get all this stuff, all our ducks in a row before we go to the accountant because that'll save us money in the long run. And that's important. So that's it. Thank you for your support and stay safe.